obviously, as you know, we've got four hours of presentations from experts from around the country, and we've got a variety of topics that I think are pretty relevant to you all. So I hope you enjoy it. And we're going to get started with a presentation on the Food Safety Modernization Act. And we've got Barbara Roscoe here. She is a professor in the Food Science Department, the director of the Food Science Department, I hope that's still accurate, at WSU. And she is going to give us this, this update. On, and yeah, I hope you all enjoy it. Thank you, Barbara. Well, thanks, everybody, for showing up early on this rainy Friday morning for uh, what I hope won't be massively dry. I'm trying to figure out here uh, see how to work your technology for a second. But uh, what I tried to do here is make a comparison between the new preventive controls rule and the produce safety rule, because I know there are processors and farmers uh, here in this audience today try to give you some clarification on what you might have to do to be compliant with these new rules that are coming up pretty fast. So for the manufacturers, we're looking at a compliance date for larger manufacturers of September 2016. So uh, what we're doing at the University of the School of Food Science is we're providing a lot of training. We're gearing up very fast to do training both for produce, the produce rule, and also for the preventive control, controls rule. If you send me an email or you look at our site, which is, I'll send this information to Chris, uh, sfs.wsu.edu, and look at our links for training, or also at the University of Idaho on the Tech Help website, you'll find all the training that we're, we have uh, going forward. Actually, tomorrow in Pullman, of all places, we're doing a one-day GAPS class. And if you can make it over to Pullman, the pass is open. <laughs> Uh, we'd love to have you tomorrow, we're doing, but we're doing uh, training in December and January on both of these rules, and we'll continue doing this as fast as we can, as much of it as we can, until we can help get everybody up to speed. So uh, thanks again for being here, and uh, with that, we'll just uh, try to get started here. I'm going to cover parts of the new produce rule and parts of the new CGMPs, and try to give you an idea of which of these programs your operations are going to be covered under. Also want to look a little bit at some of the trade impacts from the new uh, Trans-Pacific uh, trans Trade Agreements that came out in November. Okay, so where do you fall under FSMA? Okay, the biggest distinction is whether you're making a processed food or whether you're making a raw agricultural product that is commonly eaten raw. And we'll go through lists of these and you'll get to see where you might fall in these categories. So that's going to be part of the uh, analysis you're going to have to do to figure out whether you're a farm or whether you're a processor. Now there is some overlap here because there, if you're a manufacturer or processor, some of the operations that are now clearly covered under 117 are packing and holding. So we'll try to look at a distinction between what packing and holding under the farm definition versus packing and holding under manufacturing and processing might involve. So here I just want to give you some of the, what I consider to be some of the major changes under FSMA for food processors. So first is the definition of food, which is massively expanded, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, what is going to be involved in determining whether your facility is qualified and what a qualified facility is? Developing preventive controls. One of the major things that FDA is focusing on with the GMPs is on the condition of a facility, and this is going to be taken into account as part of the risk assessment and determining whether the product you're making is high risk. Allergen control programs are going to be big. Control programs now for undesirable, not just pathogenic microorganisms. Interesting new things like radiological hazards. We have to have that in our hazard analysis, unapproved additives, uh, certain types of decomposition, economic adulteration for processed foods. Now, these are not uh, things that we have to worry about specifically for produce. What the produce rule is focusing on primarily is biological contamination. So regardless, if you're a processor, you have to have a preventive controls-based food safety plan. We'll get into a little bit of an outline of what that's going to look like. It's going to include verification and monitoring and uh, a lot of new records for many people. If you're a producer of raw agricultural products, you have to have a plan for controlling microbes of public health significance. This is fairly prescriptive. It involves uh, worker hygiene issues agricultural practices, agricultural water testing uh, specifically, which I think is going to be uh, a, a new and fairly difficult compliance issue, and various issues associated with handling, handling the produce after it's been harvested. 
So there is going to be requirements for environmental testing for agricultural water quality. There's a whole section on sprouts. I don't know what's going to happen to our sprouts industry. Maybe uh, older, some other people might be able to give us some insight into that. Whole new set of requirements for sprouts. Uh, water safety process and uh, microbial specifications for organic fertilizers, manures, compost, things like that. Lots of records. And then compliance for anybody who uh, has uh, operations greater than 50K a year, 500K a year by 2017. So here's the big issue for anybody who remembers Olympia beer. It's in the water. It's all about the water. So just think about the water. I uh, read a quote from uh, Dave Gompis in Capital Press earlier this week, and he suspects that uh, farms are going to have to have uh, 20 tests for generic E. coli over the first uh, two to four years to be able to establish this new requirement for a microbial water quality profile. If you're testing uh, for sur in surface water, people that are working with surface water are going to be most impacted. Groundwater, you're still going to have to have testing, uh, water testing. And if you're using municipal water, then they're going to have to keep your municipal water testing records just like you would have under a 21 CFR Part 10. If you can't meet these water quality standards, and this is something that came out of our onion industry in the Pacific Northwest, if you can show that there, you have die off at a certain rate, uh, either between the last irrigation period and harvest or between harvest and the end of storage, you're going to be able to show that you can meet the criteria for product safety. But that's going to involve doing a uh, validated study, scientific study, to show that this die off is actually happening under conditions that would be uh, uh, field relevant. Okay, so here's food. So food is changing. I love this term. I love this definition of food. This goes back to 1936. So articles used for food or drink for a man or other animals chewing gum and other things that are covered. Okay, so we were always taught in high school that you can never use the definition of what you're defining in the definition for something. But uh, the people in 1938 believed that we sort of had an understanding of what food was. Well, now I don't think... Somebody thought that we needed to have that explained to us. And so if you look under uh, new part one of a 21 CFR, this is what food includes now. So here fruits and vegetables, very prominent. Raw agricultural commodities for use as food, components of food, animal feed. Uh, this is a, a new rule too, the animal feed rule. It's pretty extensive. Dietary supplements, dietary ingredients. Alcoholic beverages are covered as a definition of food. Live food animals, I think that's good. I'm not sure whether that means uh, consuming live little octopus at a Korean restaurant or whether that involves chickens or uh, it wouldn't be chickens, it would actually probably be fish under FDA. But it's, it's in here. Uh, but gum isn't here. So that's mean gum's no longer a food? I don't know. A very uh, prescriptive definition now for food. So let's talk a little bit about farms and manufacturers. So there's, there are three different types of farms that are addressed in the new regulations, a primary farm, a secondary farm that has to be integrated with the primary farm, and then a mixed type operation. And this would be a farm that does both farming activities and things that would be considered to be processing. And then our manufacturers who now include people that run uh, warehouses that hold food and then the, in companies that uh, pack food. So here's our definition of farm. So a primary production farm is located under one management in one general location. This was a bit of a change because uh, under the, some of the earlier iterations of this rule, they wanted the farm to be actually contiguous, but now th there's a little more flexibility here. So this is an operation that grows crops, harvests crops, raises animal, including uh, fishes, or does any number of uh, these different activities. It also includes operations that pack or hold raw agricultural commodities. The issue with a farm is that you can process food, but you can't sell it without additional regulation. And this would then, if you do that, then you're thrown into a mixed type category. So uh, you can uh, pack or process and hold, hold processed food on a farm if that uh, food is going to be consumed on the farm or a farm under the same management. Otherwise, you'd be covered under the processing rule. So under primary production, production of uh, dried fruit, specific raisins, there's an exclusion for raisins, raisins to include that as a farm activity. So there are a number of things that you can do. Um, you can, um, uh, particularly here under the, the last uh, bullet point, 
you can pack and label commodities as long as you don't do anything substantially uh, more to them to convert them into a different product form. So one of the things you might be able to do is slice or core or trim, and you'll still be, that'll still be considered a farm activity, and then you can pack that product and sell it. But if you do more, then you might be a processor and you'll be covered under a, under a defini different definition. You can also, as part of a farm, use um, technologies to manipulate ripening. So controlled, at controlled atmosphere uh, storage would be okay uh, on the farm and not be considered to be a processing activity or then again, package and label materials that you make. For a secondary activities, activities farm, this would be an operation that's not located on the primary production farm, that's specifically devoted to harvesting, possibly shelling, hulling, packing, or holding raw products, provided that the uh, production farm the primary production farm grows, harvests, or raises the majority of the raw agricultural commodities that are going to be handled by that secondary activity farm. So if you have a farm and then you have a packing house that's down the road a bit, that could be a secondary activities uh, farm, in my opinion, and you would still be included under that rule. As long as that operation, that secondary activity involves pretty much just washing, packing, labeling things that we would normally have occurring in a packing house. If you do more than that in that second in that packing house area, then you throw yourself over into uh, the processing definition. Mixed type facilities, this is an operation where you've got a farm, but the farm actually does processing. Okay, so we have a number of uh, entities I know about here in the Pacific Northwest where you'll be making jams or jellies or dehydrated products or sauces or juice or something like that, either on the farm or adjacent, on adjacent property to the farm, that would be a mixed type facility. And so your farming activities, particularly those if you're also selling raw agricultural commodities are gonna be covered under the produce rule, but you're also gonna to have to comply with the manufacturing rule for the activities that would be covered by manufacturing. So you'll have to work with within the guidance of both rules. If you're dealing in a facility like this, the recommendation I would have is sort of pick the rule you're primarily under, uh, work primarily with that, and then try to add on the secondary activities and justify to the FDA why, you're, why you made the decision that you did. So I, I think there are a lot of people that if they're making a primarily, let's say apples, and they're going to slice them, put citric acid on them in a bag and ship them, they could make the argument that they're under the produce rule because they're selling primarily a raw agricultural product that's minimally processed. If they could make that justification to the FDA and say, this is the rule I want to follow because, I think at least for a short period of time until things settle out, you'll probably be, you'll probably be okay with that. Yes, sir. Then you're you're going to be a processor. That's but what if you what if you grow and freeze them? If you grow them and freeze them, do you grow and freeze them on the same property? Yes. I think because of the way this rule is written, you're going to be covered under both rules. You're going to be a mixed type facility because the type of things they want they're looking at under um, uh, under the under the produce rule are things that are in, involved slicing, coring, hulling, shelling and then making raisins, which is actually a specific exemption. So uh, freezing, I believe, is going to be covered under the processing rule. Yeah, another question? I was thinking about that specifically because I know a lot of people freeze, you know, freeze these raw products. And um, that's going to be a processing activity. I don't see any way around it. Because you're doing more than ha harvesting, packing, and holding. This is actually a separate unit operation in there. So harvesting here are activities that are traditionally performed on a farm. This is not very clearly defined in the um, definitions or the in the in the comment period of the rule. There's a lot of comments on this, and this is uh, what the agency decided to do with it. And it's limited to certain activities, but again, there's this uh, carve-out, specific carve-out for production of raisins on a farm. It doesn't make any sense 
why this isn't considered a processing activity, but uh, there was enough political pressure to include it as a farm activity, so that's why it's here. So the argument, again, for, for processing, even though I don't necessarily like it, is the agency is going to say, uh, you're tr when you, you take berries and you freeze them, you're transforming the raw agricultural commodity into something else. And, and that's a processed food. How are we changing it into something else? Well, you're changing it from a raw berry to a frozen berry. They consider that to be a transformation that's uh, covered under processed food. Well, there's a, there's a special carve out for raisins. Do you, Walter had some comments on that. You want to talk about the raisin thing, the raisin issue? Yeah. Raisin, raisins were, can you hear me? R raisins were a special case because uh, traditionally raisins were uh, dehydrated right in the vineyard. And now it's a little bit different, but really all they do is they dry them out. And so, uh, uh, the way that the way that the uh, uh, that the rule was going to it was going to damage um, the raisin industry almost beyond repair, and to get through the White House uh, uh, Office of Management and Budget for approval as a law that's the, the way the way that rulemaking works in Washington they had they had to not do damage to existing injury, injury you know without a really good reason there was no good reason for it the answer for the uh, for the freezing part is. You're absolutely right. You're not changing the berry, but the, uh, when when uh, FDA wrote their uh, risk assessment, both risk assessments on this, the, the the thing is, is that these berries can last for years in people's freezers. So they wanted to raise the the uh, the threshold for food safety for frozen uh, products a lot higher than they are for fresh products that are gone in a matter of days or weeks. Okay. Does that help? It, it, it helps, but it doesn't make anybody's life easier. Oh, no, 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 no nobody, nobody said this was fair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any, any more questions? But, but there, is a, there is a lot of overlap here between these two, these two things, and some of it, uh, if both from a technical standpoint and from a legal standpoint, I'm a, law, I'm a lawyer, too, so it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's, we're just trying to sort it out now. But these are uh, sort of things that they consider to be harvesting activities in the FDA. I don't understand why sifting is here except to remove foreign matter because milling and sifting production of flour is considered a processing activity. But slicing isn't on here and they specifically mentioned slicing in another definition as something involved in harvesting. They didn't include it in their examples. So maybe somebody didn't like proofread this stuff. Sometimes washing is okay, but if you put an additive in the wash water that would form a coating, final coating on the, the product, that would then become a processing activity. So that's why I'm saying if you're, you're gonna wanna write a justification for why you're doing things the way you are. And if it makes some sense and your product is safe, you're probably gonna be able to get a, you know, go quite a, quite a way with that. Again, here we're looking for holding. This is uh, simply activities to uh, keep the product, staging it into a production facility or, or holding it for uh, long-term storage and distribution. You can fumigate food during storage as part of a uh, holding activity and not be covered by processing. So that's good. That's part of the produce safety rule. And you go still also dry hay and alfalfa in a field and not be considered a processor. So from a technical standpoint, we're, we're not actually changing the product form here. So I guess that would be the legal uh, justification for that. We can also hold materials as a practical necessity. So sometimes we can uh, uh, blend or we can uh, break down pallets, we can do different things, as long as we're not transforming that raw agricultural commodity into a processed food again. So here's just a list of some of the types of facilities that are considered holding operations. Uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, but grain is not a raw agricultural product, even though some people do consume it without cooking. Specific exemption for grain. So here's the definition now for, for manufacturing and processing. So here, if we're using multiple ingredients, so one of the things that came up in the comments is if you're making uh, frozen berries and you're mixing berry one with berry two and you're freezing it, now you're using multiple ingredients and you're freezing it, so that's definitely a different product form than what you started with in the minds of the uh, FDA. Uh, preparing, treating, modifying, manipulating food. So this is actually different than what we had under 21 CFR Part 110. 
So it is a new definition for manufacturing and processing. And here are some of the things that FDA considers to be manufacturing activities. What I put in uh, red were things that I thought were kind of maybe farm activities. I forgot to highlight cooling because hydro cooling uh, in the field is considered a harvesting activity, but it's listed here as a process. So there is going to be some uh, confusion and some overlap here because, again, we did have an exclusion for manipulating ripening as a farm activity. We'd be covered there. Trimming, washing, waxing. They're considering processing here, but we just saw a minute ago that those could be farm activities. So there is some overlap here. And so again, I think the, our arguments are going to be trying to justify where we think our organization fits based on what we do and then uh, go, forward with, go forward with that. Uh, here's a manufacturer. So one of the things that we have to do, whether we're raising produce and selling it or whether we're a manufacturer, is we have to be able to, within that value chain, make a determination of who is controlling the food safety risk. So if I'm the guy that puts the stuff in a... Uh, a large bin and then you take it maybe you pack it into smaller containers and put a label on it I would be the last manufacturer and I would be the one to have to be able to assure or have a written assurance of who's controlling any food safety risk along that along that channel oftentimes it will be me or it might be my supplier but I'll have to have written assurance and some type of uh, documentation of that if you're raising produce and you're not selling it directly to the market but you're selling it to somebody who's going to further process it into something else as part of your sales documentation, you're going to have to be able to uh, have written assurance from the person you're selling it to that they're going to take care of the food safety problem. Okay, so you could have a farm then that could be making some product for raw sale under the produce rule and some other product that's going to go to a processor that's not going to be covered by the produce safety rule. Yes, sir. Processor, but the processor, but the processor uh, to be able to to have all of his safeguards uh -huh. have now made all growers responsible for having GAP uh -huh. to making sure that there's traceability all the way to the all the way to the ground. That's that's true, but you but the uh, there's going to be one more complication to that. If you're selling to some processor, you're going to have to have in your sales and shipping documentation uh, a written assurance from him you're gonna to have to be able to say that you know i didn't treat this product to kill a certain pathogen and i'm selling it to somebody who's going to make it into juice and that person is going to be killing that pathogen there's going to have to be some paperwork that shows oh, who's well, going to do that yeah well yeah. with with gap there's very definitely uh, the new the way the gap is operated now is that uh it 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 kind of spells it out to the nickel that's right well now they're dividing the nickel into uh, small pennies <laughs> and you have to write it all down <laughs> so it's it's going to be very it's, it's quite complicated but there there has to be documentation now if you're not controlling a certain hazard who in that who in the supply chain is going to be doing that and we'll, we'll there, there's a slide here to talk about that uh, in a minute so here's another thing too raw uh, a ready to eat food so here it covers both uh, produce so this would be uh, something normally eaten in a raw state or something that's not, um, including processed foods that are uh, going to be eaten without further processing. So here I see there's going to be some overlap here between the produce safety rule and, uh, and other types of ready to eat items. So here we go, we've got some definitions now of what produce is, in case you didn't know. So fruits and vegetables are also including mushrooms, sprouts, peanuts, tree nuts, and herbs in this. So herbs are now a vegetable, according to the FDA. That was kind of interesting. Uh, fruit. So this is a definition that makes uh, sense to me as a biologist. But again, they're specifically, when they enumerate things, they're, they're putting a lot of nuts into this. They're very concerned about nuts. Because we've had some salmonella out outbreaks with almonds uh, over the years. Yeah, uh, so that's I think that's the major the major concern now. And and vegetables here. Bird bird, bird poop. Yeah, and then um, and there might have been some contamination of uh, both. In don't they, don't they 
Yeah, they're, they're supposed to, but if you get too high a load, then your treatment's not going to work. Yeah, and uh, sometimes there's, did you want to? Yeah. Yeah, wait for the mic, yeah. So for the salmonella in the, you know, almond, because it's low moisture food, and when you get in the low moisture status, and the salmonella is very resistant. So usually if the, you know, we cook and you know, we heat to 70 degrees, we can like a few minutes, we can kill salmonella. When you go to the low moisture status, it will increase like, you know, a hundred times or 10 times. It depends on, you know, product food matrix and plus water activity. So that's why, you know, it's becoming, there is, do have the outbreak with, you know, nuts and also other, you know, even chocolate. There is some, you know, risk over there. And it, you get some, but it still has some remaining, and they didn't flip right, but it's very resistant. So if there is some remaining survival, they don't kill it. And then that one will be very resistant. It just makes sense. Do you have a co comment? Yeah. Any anybody else wants to comment on that? That would be fine. Yeah. This is actually a really important point. Uh, you know, if, as long as you're not using, it, it, this is a really important point. As, lo as long as you're not uh, using any. Um, uh, heat treatment, any thermal inactivation. If we're just using chlorine or any other sanitizer, you cannot disinfect a contaminated piece of fruit. That's a really important point. Uh, the chlorine will not get to every little nook and cranny on the surface of the fruit. We've all seen a glass of water, you know, poured in the kitchen sink and it's got bubbles, you know, sticking around the end. Well, for a bacteria, that's like the Grand Canyon. And that's why we continue to have outbreaks of, uh, with commodities, especially like cantaloupes that have a really rough skin. But we also have on tomatoes. Look how smooth that skin is. And it's for the same reason. So you, you have, it, it's really important to understand if you take away nothing from here, controls what? Well, the best way to do the whole idea is to keep it from getting contaminated. That's why the gap programs exist. It's, all, it's preventative. That's right. That's right. Uh, we'll we'll get to that in the last session this morning. But it is it is a very difficult problem. And is uh, yeah, is our value chains? Uh, I think we're going to have more issues with this because my my personal opinion is we're starting to see more bacteria that are dangerous we didn't see before. Even though in the produce safety rule there are specific controls for E. coli 0157H7, our last outbreak was Sprouts, the big one in Europe a couple years ago was with H104. So, you know, we've, we've got new pathogens, we've got new things that we've got to worry about. But anyway, this is, a, this is what a vegetable is, including um, fungus, fruiting bodies of fungi, and sprouts and herbs. The grains are not produce. I thought that was kind of interesting. Part of this is a carve out, I think, uh, because of uh, impact to the private sector in these areas. But my concern is if I was making certain types of products that might use minimally processed uh, quinoa, for example, or uh, rice, or corn. And specifically here, there's, there's a designating dent and flint corn as grain. Sweet corn would be a vegetable. Uh, I would still want to take some special precautions to ensure that those products were, were safe. Dietary ingredients, these include herbs or botanicals. And depending on how this dietary ingredient is Composed is going to depend on uh, w whether or not this herbal botanical that's going into it is going to be uh, how far along that value of uh, the uh, pain that's going to be impacted by the produce safety rule. Yes, sir. That's right. The cooking does. So you have milling, that's going to tend to remove some surface contamination, and then you're going to, these products are going to be cooked. But we still have Dr. Zhu's issue 
with um, salmonella because uh, cereal grains, we've had have salmonella outbreaks with us uh, processed cereals and things like that. So I think uh, we have to have some controls there, but those controls are not going to be in the produce safety rule. They're going to be in the manufacturer's rule. Okay. So here's the issue, covered produce. This is not produce grown in a greenhouse or under a shade cloth. This is covered by the rule, the produce safety rule. Okay, it affects imported produce. Uh, let's see how that all rolls out. I was just down in Chile a couple weeks ago and mentioned this to them and they're all worried about it. Okay, so covered activities includes uh, farm activities. Excuse me? On, on Chile? You know, Chile the, the, the Chileans, Okay, Any, anyway, but the Chileans, because they import into the U.S., are going to have to comply with the rules just like we do. However, since we're here and the FDA is here and they can breathe down our neck a lot easier than they can down in Chile, I think enforcement is going to be uneven because it always is. Okay, that's my libertarian perspective. So here is covered produce. There's actually a long list. If you make something on this list, then um, you, uh, you have to comply with the produce safety rule, presuming the product is sold raw as a raw agricultural compo component and not to somebody else who's going to then further make it into processed food like a juice, whatever. That's part of the list. Here's more of the list. There's all sorts of things on here. Some stuff I haven't even heard of. Uh, turnips I thought was interesting and turmeric are considered covered produce, but ginger is not. I don't get that. Okay. Dried fruit. Yeah. Then wouldn't you, because of, because of, because of the, the heat, uh, uh, why would dried fruits be part of this game? Uh, dried fruits are covered under the produce rule. Raisins are. Other dried fruits, fruits are probably not uh, covered under the produce rule. I think it depends on how, you, how you've established that process. Personally, I would you know, look at my operation and try to figure out you know, what's going to be, how, do I, how am I running? Am I more like a farm or more like a processor? And then pick the rule under which I'm going to, I'm going to work. Yeah. Fruit baskets, uh, Harry and David's, that's comply. This is a very interesting thing. This is an exhaustive list, it's in the rule, that says what a covered produce item is not. Now, I picked up some things that I thought, you know, I would eat raw possibly. Uh, but this came from the, um, one of the Haynes studies, a long-term... Uh, a study where the FDA looked back at uh, historic consumption patterns in the United States and made up this um, list of products that they considered not to be covered items. Dillweed. Why is cilantro a covered item and dill isn't? I mean, I don't get this. But you are exempt from the produce safety rule if you make these products that are here under this following list. Is that your interpretation of this too, Walter? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me as a scientist uh, or as an attorney, but this is, this is the way it is. Beets. I don't know why anybody eat beets, but a lot of people eat beets raw. Okay. My daughter is one of these uh, San Francisco artist people, and she just puts everything in a blender and makes a juice out of it. So uh, all, all sorts of stuff on this list. She asparagus, everything. She'll grind it up and drink it, and she'll try to get me to drink it too. Okay, okay, so, so here are some um, exemptions here. I mentioned these a little bit. If you're ma grazing a produce item and it's, going, it's destined for commercial processing that adequately reduces the presence of microorganisms of public health significance, you're also exempt from the produce safety rule. Uh, and here are some of these things that we're looking at that if uh, the person you sell it to does any of these things and they have a validated process to show it, then um, you'll be able to... Um, you're exempt from the rule. But again, you have to, got to document that. You've got to document that you're selling it to some guy that you know is going to further process it to deal with the food safety hazard. I don't know why they picked tomatoes as an example there. There must have been some, a lot of input from the tomato industry on this part of the rule. So that's the only. But you do have to have, you have to have just documents that accompany the produce uh, to show that, the, that you did not process it adequately to reduce the presence of microorganisms of public health significance and that somebody else in the value chain is going to do that. So if you're selling it to somebody who's going to take your berries and make it into juice, you have to annually have a written assurance from them that they're going to commercially process that in a way to make the food safe. Okay, And then annually obtain that written insurance from your customer 
that's if they don't do it, that somebody else in the value chain further along is going to uh, make that product safe by processing it. So. Yeah, but what I see, where, where how I read this, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody else here in the room if, who's, who's uh, looked into this in a lot of detail, what this says to me is that if I sell it to a, let's say, a warehouse, uh, and that warehouse then sells it to a processor, I as the farmer now have to have, be able to track that to two levels, and I have to have annual documentation about that. So if I sell it to a, a company that stores it and then that warehouse then sells it to somebody else, I have to have the documentation from that somebody else to show that that product is safe if I'm going to not comply with the produce safety rule. That's, that's true, but only if he's a processor. If there's an intermediary there, then uh, you're going to be responsible for tracking that two layers. Go ahead, Walter. Now I can make this pretty simple. Uh, this is written this way specific because there's specific agricultural segments uh, or industry segments that grow. I'll use tomatoes as an example. It's a perfect one. We grow fresh market tomatoes. We don't sell them to processors. If you go buy salsa or ketchup or, or any tomato per Campbell's soup, those tomatoes are generally grown under contract and they actually use a different process. They wait till all the tomatoes are red ripe and then they harvest them all at the same time. They put them in these big gondolas, these huge open trailers. We could never, you know, we'd never be able to get them to market that way. This is written this way so that we wouldn't put this segment of the industry out of business. If you're selling fresh market berries and you sell to a processor, it doesn't matter that you're selling to a processor. Since you're selling fresh market berries, you are liable for acting under the produce rule as if they were all being sold uh, uh, in the fresh market. So it, it's that simple. Un unless you're growing specifically 100% uh, for processing and that processor has some sort of kill step, that, then uh, uh, you'll be subject to uh, uh, pretty much what, where the, the gap requirements, you know, uh, in, under the produce rule. Yes, sir. Uh, wait, wait a second here. Yeah. So as long as you're raising for commercial, what? Okay. As long as it's being raised for commercial, for, pro, for produce, or not for fresh. I just lost my thought. You're, you're going to have to get this from the end user, but does that mean then that you don't have to follow the covered produce then? You still would. I lost you well, halfway that's, through. That's not my understanding of this. If, if, I'm selling, if I'm selling my product exclusively to a uh, processor and, and I can get this written assurance from them, they're going to take all of my berries and they're going to make them into juice or they're going to can them or whatever they're going to do. Then, uh, but there has to be a kill step there. Then I have to, if I have this written assurance, then I don't have to, um, uh, you know, follow the produce safety rule. But that means none of my none of my berries can be frozen. None of my berries can go to the fresh market. In that particular scenario, you've got another question. I know you do. <laughs> so if they're if they're frozen and they're going down the line and they're going to be put into something else that you know is going to be cooked or whatever into a jam or jelly, can you go farther down the line to get that so that you wouldn't have to be in it? Uh, yes, you can, but you're going to have to be able to track that paperwork two stages. You're going to be liable as the grower to be able to track that to the guy that freezes it and then to the guy that makes the jam and jelly out of it. And you're going to have to have written assurances annually from both of those people that. Um, that there's somebody in that value chain 
that's controlling that uh, hazard of uh, bi biological contamination. And if you had that, then you would not. Then you're exempt. But you have to you have to follow this this particular provision here, and you have to have that written assurance annually from the freezer guy and then the jelly guy, and you're going to have to be the person that monitors that. So you're going to have to so that the person. So if you sell to a warehouse and that warehouse sells some of that product to the jelly manufacturer and some of it to somebody else, you're not exempt. Okay, so as a processor, I'm going to have to provide documentation for every sale that I make to the growers that, who bring us fruit. Uh, no. You're going to have to have probably an annual documentation or as part of your sales contract that you're – uh, you know what your arrangement is and who's going to be handling the um, control of the food safety issues but along we're constantly way. selling to different customers as we go along you know we don't we don't sell it all at one at one point okay. to the same group to the same manufacturer but see this is for an exemption from the produce safety rule so if you have a lot of different people you're selling to then you're not going to be exempt from this rule because you can't have you can't document the controls that would be necessary to keep you out of it is that your interpretation, Walter? Yeah. As a, as a grower, uh, and, I, as a, as a grower uh, and I ship it to the processor, I'm strictly a grower, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I wouldn't blame any processor, say it's none of your business of who I sell it to because I, I, I perform my responsibility, he performed his, and then as it goes on from him, either then the in buyer, if there's a problem, he would then go back to the, the processor or, or follow it even back further to the grower. But, uh, but for having a, to having a processor give the list of the names of the people that he's selling a product to, I wouldn't like it at all. That's right. And that means that you're not, Charles had a comment, I think. Uh, <clears throat> yes. From FDA's standpoint, and forgive me for being blunt, they don't care whether you like it or not. If the information has to be transferred up and down the supply chain to provide evidence for an exemption from these rules, then the information has to be passed up and down the supply chain. Yeah. Sir. So just to make clear, most everybody here I know I do work for does IQF, so you're all freezing, or you're selling to a juice company. So if you're all selling IQF or you're all freezing, you're following the, you're freezing the berry. So uh, does it matter if they're selling to a, a juice company, even though they're still doing IQF? Well, if they're doing IQF and not all of that product is going into juice, then there's a presumption that those berries are going to be consumed as a ready to eat food. And so they're going to have to, people are going to have to comply with this produce safety rule. So most of you that are doing IQF, even though you're selling to a juice, you're going to have to do the IQF part. Yeah. Unless a hundred percent of it is going down and you can document it. Right. Think of it this way. Here, here's what they're trying to prevent. I'll, I started with tomatoes, so I'll use, I'll use the, uh, the tomato example that, uh, that FDA uses. And that's, um, you're growing tomatoes for processing. But all of a sudden, the fresh market goes up to $40 rather than 6 What they don't want are those tomatoes that have not been grown for fresh with the, with the proper controls to get into the fresh market. That's what they're trying to prevent. And then as far as the record keeping goes, if you're a processor, the guarantees that you have to give are to the people that you're sourcing products from. It's expected that you're doing everything right as you're moving forward. And uh, Charles will probably speak better than I can to this, but uh, uh, as far as the record keeping, the traceability goes, it's all one step forward and one step back. You can't be expected to know where your customers are going with their product. And there's one more gentleman here who had a question. Um, I'm not sure if it was answered already, but so just to, to follow the thought process here. So if we're a mixed operation, um, we process, like Kent was saying, we, we do IQF, and then we have our, our farm, the farm operation. So uh, regardless of IQF or not, as long as we know that we sell the IQF product or not IQF product, whatever. If all our product is sold to somebody else, that's 100% of our product is going to go to someone that's going to have a heat treatment, mm -hmm. then the farm portion of our operation 
doesn't have to comply with this proto safety rule. But we still have to go through the process of a hazard analysis, et cetera, because we have to get to that conclusion, okay, right? But then, then you have to presume that none of your product is going to be sold fresh. Right. Okay. Yeah. Assuming that if 100% of our product goes into someone else that's going to heat treat it, the farm doesn't have to comply with the produce rule. That's right. Okay. That's so my reading of it. The yeah. processing side, because we're, it's IQF, we're freezing. Yeah. So we do fall under the preeminent controls rule. Now, there, even though we say, and we're talking about hazard, right? Even though we say that a hazard is going to be controlled by somebody else, 100% of our product is going to be sold to someone that's going to heat treat it. We're not exempt from the preventive controls. You're not we'll, exempt from preventive yeah. controls. Well, that's so correct. the only portion of a mixed operation is the farm that can be exempt. The processing, regardless if 100% of the product is going to be heat treated, you're not exempt from preventive controls, right? That's correct. That's correct. In that particular scenario. Okay. So then here's some other things too. But the whole issue is, is, is figuring out who's controlling that, that issue in the supply chain. So I just wanted to get through a couple issues here, certainly run out of time. Uh, but here are the general requirements for processed foods. So this looks like a HACCP plan. Uh, we have, have issues here now, new parts, supply chain management, allergen controls, recall programs, worker training and audit. One thing is gonna affect your operations, you're gonna have to document your worker training. You're gonna have to have an initial worker training program for everybody on hygiene. And you're gonna have to have annual renewals of that. Okay, for processors, you have to deal with biological, chemical, and physical hazards. On the farm, we're only concerned about biological hazards. So they didn't spend a lot of time in this produce rule on pesticide residues and those types of issues. It's kind of interesting to me that they didn't. Okay, microorganism, uh, that's pretty much the same definition under both rules. I just want to try to find a couple things that are interesting uh, here. It's going to be um, uh, problematic, particularly for growers. A lot of it is going to involve environmental testing. Under Part 112, the produce rule, there's specific testing requirements for E. coli 0157H7 in sprouts, salmonella, and listeria, uh, if those are, are risk factors, and then generic E. coli for water testing programs. We have mandatory environmental monitoring now for all of our food processors. Okay, so I don't want to put, uh, you know, go into this in any detail, but there's going to be, uh, this is going, going to cause some issues because if you do find listeria in your facility, you're going to have to take uh, uh, actions. And one of the actions I think the FDA is going to want you to take is a market withdrawal, unless you can show them that that's, that you don't really have to do that. Just to. Yes. Just. Just to clarify, when you say listeria, it's listeria monocytogenes and listeria species. That's right. Okay. But if you do find a, if you're doing your environmental control program and you're looking for list, generic listeria, you have to go back and determine whether or not it's monocytogenes or not. So if you're going to you have to it. hold your facility until you hold your product in the facility to make sure that that's not the case, and then you could release it. Yeah, just yeah. to clarify. Just so to clarify. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Uh, all this information that we've been getting here so far appears that it's the same type of information that we're getting required as a grower of getting having a GAP certification. And, and, and so this is what this is mainly about, uh, is how the feds are, are uh, setting up the GAP. Essentially, this is a GAP rule. Okay. And one of the things that um, there is going to be requirement for is you're going to have to be able to document training uh, you know, document training that at least one person in your facility, whether you're in a manufacturing facility or whether you're in a produce uh, operation, has, has uh, sufficient training to understand the rules and be able to implement uh, the requirements that are there. So there is going to be a, a significant training requirement here. So I, I know I'm almost out of time. Chris, do you want me to just sort of wrap this up or just keep on going? Um. Yeah. I, why don't you try to hit some main points? I do want okay. to kind of stick to schedule. Okay. Okay. So, so why don't we just stop questions? I know everyone's got a okay, lot. Yeah. Let's just stop them for okay. a bit. So Including you, Daryl. Okay. <laughs> sure, of course. Yeah, this is, this is helpful because the, the most important thing okay. is to get okay. people's questions answered whenever they have them. So, and and, uh, and I, just one sec. Walter did say that we'll have a uh, – during his session, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to answer, ask a lot of these questions. So just write them down. Um, and I will also say we're recording this, and 
we'll provide these PowerPoints to everyone in this room. So. Right. Okay. So here's the here's the major issue for produce. So uh, there there is an animal control provision. There's actually an, an endangered species provision in here, which I know is going to affect you guys with migratory birds. Uh, so you can't shoot migratory birds, even if they contaminate your produce. Uh, all sorts of issues with uh, biological soil amendments, water testing, water quality monitoring, I think is going to be the most important part of this for everybody. Okay, again, we have to have qualifications. People have to have training, and there's going to be uh, annual requirements for training and training documentation, both for produce uh, here, mostly hygiene type training, even for temporary and seasonal workers in a way that they can understand it, okay? But for each facility, whether it's a manufacturer or a, a produce uh, operation, you're gonna have to be able to show that there's at least one qualified individual at the facility who's successfully completed training that is at least equivalent to the standardized curriculum that's been approved by the FDA, and these are coming out right now, and we're gonna be doing at our university a lot of training uh, based on these curricula. So we'll be able to help you out there. Same thing for produce. And then the preventive controls qualified individual essentially has to manage all the documentation and requirements for the food safety plan. Okay, again, here again, we're looking at an annual review of uh, product retraining. I did wanna to touch on a couple things with uh, exports here. We do now have this uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership that involves Chile, Peru, Mexico, US, Canada, Japan, uh, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, and Brunei, Australia, New Zealand. I think that's all of them. Okay, critical here, in my opinion, is not, is not Japan or China, or, or, or Korea and China. So we do now have a, 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 a trade a partnership here, kind of good, I guess. Uh, because we have about 20% of our farm income coming from exports. We have a lot of uh, tariffs uh, imposed on us and from the U.S. market. We're hoping the TPP is going to open some foreign markets to us in the U.S. for agricultural products. So if you look here at uh, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, you can see that our, some of our major exports are going to be fruits, nuts, and vegetables. And so the value of the, our combined market is about $9 billion coming out of our three states here. So this is really important. These provisions are really important for us. And we're hoping that uh, one of the things that's going to happen here is with these changes in food safety, that we're going to be able to uh, have some improvements in food safety among our trading partners. I still think there's going to be a lot of non-tariff trade barriers erected to us in many markets around the world because our foreign suppliers are going to be facing these requirements and they're not going to like it. And so they're going to, a lot of trade barriers are going to show up in different places. But we are hopeful that uh, there's going to be some harmonization of uh, food safety regulations uh, within at least the TPP. And at this point, that's going to mean FSMA because this is the first thing out of the box. Okay, we are hoping that we are going to see some tariffs dropping on agricultural products, elimination of agricultural export subsidies from uh, different countries and import restrictions. And that maybe we'll see some improvements in food safety on uh, products around our, our trade region. Uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. So there is going to be some issues with audits. There are audit requirements in both of these rules, the preventive controls and the uh, produce safety rules. I'm not sure how this is going to uh, work. Uh, right now, the FDA's uh, foreign uh, audit program is a, a complete failure as far as I'm concerned. So a lot of um, Part of it's because there's not enough people, but part of them is uh, there's all sorts of issues with uh, jurisdiction uh, with foreign inspections. So a lot of the uh, requirements now for uh, imported product safety is on the backs of the uh, U.S. importer, and that's going to be uh, somewhat difficult to deal with. But we're hoping that maybe the TPP, some of this will shake out and we'll get some trade agreements and some recognition of uh, different countries' food safety programs as everybody comes up to speed. But anyway, this is, um, I just wanted to sort of provide a short overview for some of the new requirements that are coming out. The produce safety rule just came out the last part of November, so this is all really new stuff hot off the press. A lot of compliance deadlines coming up really fast. Uh, at the university, we're, we're here to help you. We're going to try to get this stuff launched as fast as we can and give you as much technical support as we possibly can. And we're predicting that we're going to have similar regulations adopted across uh, the uh, 
Pacific region and probably also around the world. So if you're exporting, you're in that market, we're going to see a, a bunch of changes uh, in our some of our foreign markets. So with that, I'll leave the stage and turn the... Uh, great. Not much. Less than 1%. Do you know the exact figure, Charles? Product. That's right. Oh, well, thank you very much. Everybody. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Rasco. And I think we have time. I'll change the